Uh, AC was telling us the other day that he felt like you were one of the leaders. Um, what did you, uh, in, in during the hiatus, um, what did you kind of see as your role in uh, not only keeping the, the players together and the chemistry going, but what also it was, do you think, the most constructive um, activity or way you guys kept together? Um, well, I mean, obviously it was the you know group chat, just because, you know, with the millennials now, text messaging, everyone, you know, that's why I got my Instagram so I can keep in contact with everyone, seeing how everybody's doing workout-wise and stuff like that. But for me, it was just, I mean, it was nothing, nothing different. I think just from my natural personality as an outgoing communication guy. And so during that two weeks, you know, LeBron might have had some of his games from Miami. You're we're talking about that in the group chat. You're talking about what's going on, people's beards, you know, Kuz doing a fashion show in his house because he's bored, getting a dog. I mean, there's so much going on that you just want to have. And then there's a time where you got to start tightening it up. Start getting serious. Start, you know, why are we here to, you know, finish the season and keep everybody in tune and work out wise and what's the goals and for us is staying locked in because you we, we all knew that this could be a possibility um, and you know LeBron's obviously a leader. AD leads in his own way, but I would just say I'm a little more vocal on talking to one through 15, and that's my job. I've been in this league for a while. I've mentored a lot of young players and Booker and John Wall and Giannis and so. Me be like, I'm one of the rare vets that can speak to one through 15 because I've played with guys like Shaq and I've been on guys of DMP, so I've been, I've been through it all. All righty, Brad Turner. What's up, Jared Dudley? What's up, brother? Good, man. Uh, doing these group chats, <clears throat> what's LeBron James' mindset been like, his approach with you guys? I mean, for one, LeBron's a goofball. Let's be honest, okay? Let's be honest. You, you, we all have different personalities and different sides. So LeBron is someone who keeps it lighthearted. He's the one entertaining, being funny. And every now and then, he, you know, he'll say something serious or, you know, one of the guys getting back in town. Hey, you know what? Jim's getting ready to open up. Uh, who, who we got? Checking on your families, making sure everyone's right. But you know when you get that text and it's not a funny one, you know, okay, hey, listen, let's, let's tighten up or – Let's come on back home, or you, and you you know it sometimes just by you know it's kind of like a, uh, you know a father looking at his son, you know and look at you a different way. You got to know, and so for LeBron, he he's the leader, he's the alpha, and so, uh, but he's 50-50. He jokes just as much as he's serious, man. He he keeps it really even balanced. So uh, for him, um, he's ready for this moment. You could tell, you can see in his beard, he's ready. He he ready to lower down and put that put that Beijing in ASAP. Hey, Jared, I'm curious, uh, throughout the pandemic, has there been one guy in particular, maybe on the Lakers, who you've uh, especially been in contact with helping guide? And then second of all, I'm just curious about your feelings headed into the bubble in terms of, you know, COVID cases spiking and then, you know, issues with some guys considering whether they should participate in the bubble for social justice issues. What has been your thought process around that entire thing? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I take it as a pride to be equally balanced with my teammates. So obviously the, the person you would, for me, first comes to mind is Kuzma. Um, I'm really cool with Kuz. He's the one I feel like I could help the most. He's the one I feel like has the most potential to take us over the top. And so for me, it's trying to balance with him is, hey, how do you develop your game but still not take away from a championship team? It's very tough. So we want him to reach his potential. But during that, we can't have wasted possessions of what we're trying to accomplish here, especially when you have LeBron and AD on the floor. You can't waste too many possessions. So for me, it's letting him know, hey, your time's coming. This is what you can improve on while you're on the floor, when you're not on the floor with them. And, and, and don't look at numbers. Don't look at stats. That's for first thing first. And then Keith has been a teammate three times. And Keith is an interesting nugget just because with the uncertainty of Dwight right now, not really knowing, and hopefully he does show up. But someone who could play some stretch five, someone who's physical. And I told him, a lot of people look at the stretch five, uh, a five as a negative, right? AD, I don't want to play the five. People look at that. And people don't understand is there's huge advantages at the five. I made my money becoming a stretch four. It's because someone can't guard Keith on the outside. So it's, he can shoot the three ball. And so that, that's my whole thing is trying to bring perspective to both sides. It's, hey, uh, Rondo. I was one of the few guys who kept in contact with Rondo. You know, Rondo, he goes to Louisville. You do, he's out of sight, out of mind. So for me, it was just contacting him, and we're going to need playoff Rondo. So I, I take it e equally for all of them. I see it, keep in contact with them throughout the break and letting them know what we need from them. All right, 
Alrighty, I see that Mike Trudell has joined us, so I'm going to let him ask a question. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> What's up, Jared? How are you? What's going on? Good. How's that IG going? You see, it's booming. Ooh, it's booming. Yeah, I see. I see it's of the booming. Um, yes. Hey, I, I want to ask you about the the LeBron AD dynamic on offense and sort of you know, you, what you've seen from AD being able to raise his game when needed to on that game. Uh, at certain times, but at other times, he doesn't have to as much because LeBron can be so dominant. I just wondered if you if you have a different expectation of where AD can keep getting to, uh, including some of what we've seen in the playoffs past with him, you know, against Portland in the 4 so Just just a, It's a long-winded question, but your thoughts on that dynamic on offense between LeBron and AD? Uh, AD definitely has another gear. I think AD's the first time in his career since maybe Kentucky where – you know, on any given night, he didn't have to be the main scorer, number two scorer. And I think that he's so efficient, so unselfish, that sometimes he tends to be too passive. We need him to be more aggressive. We need him to be on that block. And even though he can make the same amount of shots from the outside, well, you getting one or two of those fouls gets us into the bonus. A la Shaq back in the day with how good they were, we need to get into that bonus so we don't have to always work for long twos. Uh, I think him and LeBron were playing, you know, cat and mouse of, of oh, you score. All right, now my turn. Instead of just being fluid, and I, I think you guys caught that during the second part of our year, that, hey, it was just whoever had it going. We found a nice little substitution pattern between them two. But you know in the playoffs, man, that, that, that gets really get thrown out. You only go eight to nine deep, and – you find a mismatch every team, you know, you, you, you try to, you know, you try to exploit it. And AD at the five, AD at the four, AD in the post, we're going to need him to be physical. We're going to need him to be dominant. I, I, defensively, it, does, it doesn't, I don't have any worry. Offensively, it's not a worry, but I just want him to be aggressive. And that's for me and LeBron and some coaches to be in his ear. And LeBron, we want LeBron to give us whatever we need on that night. And sometimes we might need you to score 14 in the first quarter. And I think I've only had to say it one time, uh, one time leaving the halftime, like, look to score now. Stop passing the ball. You know, a lot of time he gets it. And you, who, 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 who is it for me to give him advice? But it's when I see on the floor where, hey, I know you're making the right play, but right now we need you to get after it. And so I think it's our team and communication and balance. Uh, but AD is going to be the most critical part of us on this quest for a championship in the bubble. All righty, Dave McMenamin. Thank you, Jared. Good. How you doing, brother? Good. Um, when did the dynamic begin between you and Kuzma? Did you have discussions with the coaching staff about it? You could become the guy for him, or it was just something that you saw? You know? See, what people don't realize, I saw Kuzma when I used to work out when he was in college at Utah at Impact. I, go, I train at Impact every year in the summertime. I actually called my agent to recruit Kuzma. I was like, yo, who's this kid killing all these pros? And so he actually signed with my agency, Mark Bartlesey, in priority. So I already had a relationship somewhat. And then I went through my hanging out with all the young kid phases where I had D'Angelo, Devin Booker, and they're all, you know, they got the little buddy pal system in the summertime here in LA they all hang out with. So when I wanted to come to LA, Booker already told them how I was with him. D'Lo told him how I was in Brooklyn. So it was just an easy transition, hanging out with them, dinners. And, and I think that I always told Booker and I always told these guys, this is how you get a max contract. This is what you have to do. And his route is different on a championship team. He can't do what Booker and D'Lo does, but he can still get it. He can still be an all-star caliber player. He just has to go about a different way. And so I'm trying to teach him, which is hard for a 23, 24-year-old playing for the Lakers in Hollywood and with so much prestige to want to be able to pick and choose your spots. Jared, uh, going back to the uh, the dynamic in in Orlando, I know you talked when we talked to you like feels like 15 years ago, but it was right uh, when we talked to you then you said that you know a lot of young guys around the league were, were calling you kind of about the potential of what this could look like and whether it was a good idea and all that. I'm curious when you have those conversations. I'm assuming those are still going on. What is everyone's comfort level with just the safety dynamic of of the the bubble environment? And then for you personally. Um, what's your comfort level with um, just how safe it's going to be? I mean, I, I would be lying to you if I told you everyone was completely comfortable and had no 
you know, ill feelings towards of how it's going to be. I think we all know it's a risk. I think right now we, we all are watching all the news and we keep seeing the Corona cases in LA and California, I mean, Arizona, Miami, Florida. And so we see what's going on, but we look at it this way. I mean, we literally get tested every other day. If we're positive, they quarantine us, make sure we're right. When we get down there, we have to take two tests before we leave. We have to quarantine 48 hours there. Mind it, it'll be my birthday, July 10th. I'll be quarantined in a hotel room. All right, so we have to do that. And then when we're out there, I mean, you, you have the best medical expert. But I mean, I, I keep trying to tell people, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I don't think no one fears like death. I think they fear they could potentially get it. And I think that they would think it would suck that they're gonna be quarantined seven days in a you know little house that they know nothing about. And I think that every day, People that work like you guys and when you go to your office, some people do at restaurants, you know, there, there is sometimes you got to provide for your family. Now, we do make a lot more money than people, but we understand the business of basketball while we have to be able to play. I think it's also a duty to be able to entertain. But for me, I'm comfortable going there. Um, I think it's, you know, a little bit, you know, sad that you're going to meet your mom, you're going to miss your family for potentially six to eight to three months, depending on situations. And I think that's what's been the difficult part more than anything. Uh, but I'm also excited, man. Like, this is the closest I'll get to winning a championship. This is where it's going to be in history when you get down there and people say asterisk or this. And that's, you know, inter, inter, uh, you know it's everyone's opinion on that. But for me, it's if we win a championship, we still get a parade here. We get a parade. And for one of me, it counts for me. That's all I'm saying. So and I, I'm just excited to be, able to, to be able to go through that process with the Lakers. All right. We're going to do a couple more. Um, Brad Turner? Yeah, this is a article right now report that says the Players Association and the NBA have agreed on social messaging for the back of the jerseys. Are you aware of that? And what do you think that's going to do for all of you guys going forward? I just saw that. I just saw that, if I'm not mistaken, it was like 10 different things you could pick. And so I think it's the right step. I think that um, it's always tricky because I love the Players Association. I love everything what they do. I wish that more players outside the Players Association would have more of a say on it. You know, what if LeBron wanted or AD wanted something different? And then maybe they could maybe they could voice it and get it approved. That would be nice. And I just think that the NBA is, you know, we lead. And Adam Silver to me is the best at what he, he he's trying to make it right. He's trying to be able to bring awareness. He wants to be a front and center. And for the players that were kind of missed, you know, I don't know if I should go there. We don't feel like the protest would, the, 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 the league would take over the protest and what it stands. And he's basically giving you guys a platform, a stage. Uh, I know they're going to do some cool different stuff. I think I, I even heard commercials, not even with the court and what they're going to be able to do. And so the names, I like it. I think it's good to give people uh, a different chance. I just like you be able to have a little bit more say if it's approved the right message. Okay, and Andy Kamenetsky, please. Hey, Jared. Um, I'm sure you saw the, there's news that an NFL team uh, may likely end up changing its name because it's uh, finally being deemed too offensive to have it. Just it's all part of the moment that we're in right now. How much confidence does that give you just that the moment we're in can be sustained when you guys are in Orlando and that you really can use that time to keep the messaging going. I'm not worried about being in Orlando because the NBA, and not only the Players League, I mean, we, they, they've been like that. Adam Silver has been that, the commissioner, so I'm not worried about that. The NFL, it, it, it's, always, it's always tricky when you have to be pressured. So when, you know, the Redskin name, if it wasn't for FedEx and these high, you know, sponsors, you know, you, you heard the, the, the headline on ESPN, 41 people, you know, of $625 billion threatened to be able to, all right, so the, all right, if, if you hold a gun to his head, obviously you're going to do it. So, uh, but it's a, it's a start. It's a start for some change. And the question is, where are we at six, eight, eight months when the season's over? Where are we at uh, voting? Uh, laws and education. I think that this is nothing that I expect to be done over a year or two years, but it's something that we need to just have the education, be able to have the resource to be able to listen both sides. Not every white person's a racist, not every this person is that. And I think it's just good to be able to have that. So I, I love the NBA, the, the dialogue they have it. I think Orlando, it's gonna be phenomenal. Get star players to thing to be able to talk about. You guys are gonna ask questions when you get down there after games, it's gonna be talked about. But then now next season, you know, life goes on, and that's where I think that we need to get out of the country and as a whole. And the last question, thanks, um, Jared, for taking all these questions. Yes. The last one, Kyle Goon, please. Hey, Jared, um, that, just kind of following up on you saying you feel like your responsibility is 1 through 15. Yeah. Keep up with that communication. I was wondering to what extent 
have you talked to Avery and Dwight um, about their respective decisions? And as, as one of the guys who's been pretty vocal uh, for a couple of months about trying to finish the season and having the opportunity, how do you kind of um, reconcile their decisions with your own preference to, to finish this out? No, I definitely talked to them throughout, uh, not recently, definitely talked to them. Uh, good friends of mine, all good friends. And one thing about it, one thing you have to respect in life is family. Regardless of everyone's situation, so differently, my my wife and my kids and stuff like that. And so, obviously, both of them have different perspectives, different things. We respect it. We hope Dwight comes. We need Dwight. Um, and for Avery, man, you know, with his with his son and and, and those kind of health concerns and that, you totally understand that. And with Dwight, with the situation, man, come on, that's. I think we all can respect that, what he's having to endure and stuff like that. And so for us, his life is more important. Uh, we love to have it, but it's not, I don't have any ill will towards any person that wants to sit out. So like it's just me personally, it's where I'm at and where I feel comfortable, uh, with my family decision. Um, and it'd be something different if my wife didn't want me to go and how it is, but for them, you know, it's just going to be, it's a little bit different without Avery. It'd be a little bit different, you know, any teammate not being there potentially, but uh, Dwight, I know there's uh, still hope and still chance and we're, we're hoping to see him down there.